Standing on the promises, Christ my King. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises sing. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of Sunday. Glad to have you here. But just before we pray, can I ask you a question? And we sing standing on the promises. Can you give me a promise that you're standing on? You can raise your hand. I'll repeat it for those watching from home. We, we sing standing on the promises. Give me a promise as a believer that you're standing on. What was that? Eternal life. Eternal life guaranteed. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. How about another promise? What are you standing on? What's that? All right, never alone. I think I heard daily provision. All right, so he promised to meet all our needs if uh, we're one of his. I, I, I direct the, I trust the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not, I will direct thy paths. You know, we sometimes sing those songs, but then when you get down and say, well, name a few. Pro oh, 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 I don't know too many here. All right, hopefully you've got many. Yes. Okay, call upon me. All right, right here. What was that one? Okay, hey, that's going way back, all right? Genesis, they said, I promise never to judge the entire earth, destroy it with a flood again. That is a great promise. Right back here. Parents are like, uh-oh. So, all right, hey, he's promised to remove our sin and take away our sin when we call upon him in repentance and faith. You said, I'm coming again. All right, are we standing on that promise? The Lord is coming again. You know, I pray that our mind, when we sing those songs, it shouldn't just be a good tune, a good melody. Wow, this is great. We're all singing. Our minds should be on the Lord. It should be on the scriptures. It should be on the very promises that we stand upon. And that should be the rock on which we stand, based on the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself. And I'm so thankful for those promises. Just before we pray, give you a couple updates on some of our church folks here. Uh, obviously, pray for the Gonzaleses. You saw them here a little bit this morning. They went back home now. 
Uh, they weren't feeling good. They've, they've been out for about a week. There's been some virus sickness through the family. They were here for Sunday school, but uh, they saw me and said, we've got to get home. We're just not feeling good. So pray for them. I'm sure they get a little discouraged. You know what that's like. Finally get out of the house a little bit, fellowship, and then you're not feeling good. So pray for both of them. I think both the parents weren't feeling so good. Not sure about all the kids. Pray for Francis, Maceris. I don't see Francis here today. It is her birthday. If you have her... She's here. All right. She stepped out. All right. So Francis is here. It is her birthday today, but I know she's going through some challenging times. You saw the prayer chain. All right. She has a sister who lives out in the South Bend, Indiana area. Tried to commit suicide just a day or two ago. Uh, a lot of struggles. Not, not sure that she saved her, her, her husband, uh, drugs and things like that. So please pray. I know she's deeply burdened for her family. She's lost three siblings, even within the last year. And so it's tough when distance keeps you from there. And so pray for her. You see her. I know she could use some encouragement, in the Lord. And then pray for Sue Tribe. Many of you asked about Sue. Many of you know she had a fall at work. And uh, it is covered from workman's comp. She did end up breaking her tailbone. Uh, her head, was she hit, did not need stitches. So did get a chance to see her before the work days. Uh, she's doing better. Dave texted while we're at the work days and said she's doing a little bit better. She's able to stand a little bit, walk slowly, gingerly. Was having trouble uh, eating, obviously keeping food down because of the medicine she was on. So pray for her. Probably out of work for five weeks, they said. So I'm not sure when we'll see them here. Uh, probably be a little while. They're probably watching from home. I know they watch when they're able to. So pray for them. Pray for Dave. And I know Heather, their daughter's doing a lot as well, sort of helping and watching over there. Obviously Noah, there at their home as well, not able to do as much. So pray for Sue, uh, Dave, their family. Some of you have already no doubt reached out. I know some have already provided meals. If that's something you'd like to do on your own, obviously you're welcome to do that. I know it'd be a blessing to their family, but especially encourage her, encourage them in prayer as well as these others. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer before the choir ministers and song. Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for a beautiful day. Lord, I know many today are, are not here. They're with their mothers that maybe live locally. They wanted to spend the day with them, be in a church service with them. or a grandmother, Lord, and we're thankful for that. I pray it be a special day, an encouraging day, Lord. I know others, Lord, have their mothers. They're still living, but not here, Lord, not close by like my mom and others. So perhaps today is a phone call, maybe a FaceTime, Lord, just to, to tell them how much we love and appreciate them. I know there's others, Lord, their mothers have passed away, Lord. Their mothers and maybe in heaven, maybe not, Lord. They're no longer here. I know they love their mother. They're appreciative for that, Lord. I know there's some sorrow there. Uh, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your promises in the word of God that we're able to stand upon. And Lord, when we feel those moments of discouragement, when we feel those moments of just fear, when we feel those moments, Lord, of, of just quitting and giving up, Lord, I pray that our, we would stand on the very promises of the word of God, knowing, Lord, that all the promises in the Bible are based upon your very character, God himself. And, Lord, we know that you do not change, and we can put our faith and trust in you, Lord. And we're so thankful that every one of your promises has always been true and been kept. Lord, we thank you for each one that's here today. Lord, we do pray for several in our church family. Pray for Sue, Lord, uh, out of work now for some time. Lord, I pray for daily healing and strength there, Lord. Pray that these uh, bones that were broken would heal properly. We pray for rest. We pray for, Lord, just that you would strengthen her. We thank you for children, her children and grandchildren that could help perhaps. Give Dave the strength that he needs as well. as doing a lot of, no doubt, running around and driving to doctor's visits and hospitals and things like that. And I pray that through this time, they would see that our church family loves them in a great way. Lord, we certainly pray as well for the Gonzaleses. Help them, Lord, as they're home probably by now, just not feeling well. Lord, I pray that you would bring healing to the family. They've been sick for some time now. Let them get some needed rest. I pray be able to get back up on their feet. Lord, we pray for Miss Francis who's here today. No, it's her birthday, Lord, and no doubt uh, she's got mixed emotions on her birthday, but Lord, burden for a lot of her family. Lord, she's lost several siblings, her sister now, Lord, in the hospital and going through some difficult times. And Lord, distance is, is a challenge, Lord, not able to be there for her and, and hold her hand and pray with her. So I pray, Lord, that the opportunity she had through phone calls, days ahead that she would be a great uh, strength and encouragement as she shares the gospel, Lord. We're not sure that uh, her sister and brother-in-law know Christ. Lord, use this time where sometimes through hard times you hit ground bottom, Lord, they would turn to you. They would see they need you, Lord. They would turn to you rather than drugs or anything the world offers and find true salvation. Lord, encourage Francis, I pray today in the Lord. Again, Lord, thank you for an opportunity to be here on this day. May all that's done glorify you. Lord, speak to our hearts, minister, Lord. Prepare our hearts for the preaching of the word through the choir and our additional hymn. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and we remember what Christ said no greater love have a man than this and that a man laid down his life for his friend this next song we're going to sing is 161 what a friend we have in Jesus let's go ahead and stand once again and sing what a friend we have in Jesus 161 
And as they are slipping out, I invite you to open your Bible to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, that's right about in the middle of your Bible. If you need to borrow one of our pew Bibles, there should be one handy. You could turn to page 963 in the pew Bible, page 963, if you need to use one of our pew Bibles. Proverbs 31, we will read Proverbs 31 here at the beginning. And we will only see it again at the end. We'll be in Genesis primarily. But we're going to read Proverbs 31. Appreciate that song. You may not have grown up in a godly home. You may not have grown up in a Christian home. You may not have had saved parents. We understand that. Your memories may not all that be favorable of your child rearing. You may have been in a broken home, single parent, bounced around, adopted, fostered. A lot of different backgrounds that people have. God makes no mistakes. God's bigger than any of those things that have been done, but I pray that whether you can think back and maybe that song reminded you of a mother, grandmother, father, or maybe not, but I pray it reminded you of someone who played a part in your life. No, it doesn't really take a village. It doesn't. It just, it takes a mom and a dad. It takes a single parent with God, but we do understand there are people that play roles in our lives. There are people that God puts there, and you may not even remember their names, Every time I hear that song, I do think of a lot of different people. I, I think of Sunday school teachers, some p- people I can't remember their name when I was second grade, someone that worked with me in Jet Cadets, Whirly Birds. I think of people that had parts of my, I think of Bob and Vera at Circle K. I think of Bobby and Vicky who took a chance on me as being a counselor. I think of counselors that had me. I think of the Fries, who I still get the fellowship with, who uh, had me in seventh and eighth grade as a rebellious rascal, and they were the junior church teen workers. I think of people up through the day. I think of teachers, coaches, Christian school teachers, aunts, uncles, relatives. Yes, parents, grandparents who played a part in my life. And uh, it made a difference. Some of those folks, like you, you, they're not here. They're in heaven. Some of them are, and we need to take the chance we have to thank them for that. I wouldn't be surprised if God's put someone on your heart for years. And you say, I I need to. I need to write them. You haven't done it for years, years. I mean, it could be 20 years. I really need to. They're getting up there. I don't know their address. You, you can do it. You can find it. And I'll tell you what, what a difference that would make if you just wrote a thank you. You know what? You may not remember me. You may not even know who I am. You may forget me, but I want you to know you made a difference in my life as a fourth grade in your Sunday school class, as a senior in school, as a person I worked for for two months. Whatever. I hope that you'll take advantage of that. Many times we have good intentions, but never do get around to letting people know we're thankful for them. I'm thankful again for you, thankful for again. We honor today wives and mothers. We understand not everybody is a wife, not everybody is a mother. Not everybody has a mother that's still living. Not everybody had a mother that was godly or saved. But we do thank the Lord for especially faithful, biblical, godly mothers that we can honor on this Mother's Day. Proverbs 31, a very familiar passage for many, not necessarily preaching from this, but I would like to start off today's message by reading Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31. For sake of time, I won't read the first nine verses, but it is very important to read those nine verses. Notice verse 1, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Most believe that that's just another name for Solomon. Solomon, King Lemuel, the same. Can't prove that or not, but it is likely. In fact, we won't look at verses 1 through 9, but interesting, her main message to her son was to not drink alcohol in any form. 
that interesting message from a mother to her son. All right, a message we need to still have today for everybody. But we're going to pick up in verse number 10 and read through the end. And then we're going to have a word of prayer. Jump into this morning's message. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price, her value is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hands to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. And what's the bottom line then? Her children... So we know this is referring to a mother. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. And we come to the conclusion. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. And then we come, it's still the conclusion, but then we have what would be a proverb or two here. Truth, spiritual truth. Favor is deceitful. The idea here is more on the outward appearance of the, the beauty of the, the looks, though they're important. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. It is fleeting. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Proverbs 31, a wife, a mother. doesn't mean every attribute there is directly what you have, but I think if you summarize all that, and I'm not preaching on this this morning, it would be a summarize of much of motherhood. Hardworking, not ashamed or afraid to work, whether in or out of the home, the housekeeper, the children, the husband, the family, food and cleaning, all the things that make up a mother, a wife. But truth be told, there are billions, billions of mothers that do that. And we praise them for that. But smaller still is the group that know the Lord. Very few people, very few, though there are those, would say that your mother was not loving. Well, we know that there are mothers who are not loving. There are mothers who are not hardworking. There are mothers who are not kind. There are mothers who are not nice. But the vast majority of people would normally say, oh, my mother was very loving, very nurturing, I'm thankful for her, all that she did, hardworking, tireless. May have been a single family home where dad wasn't there, died, walked out, whatever, and she worked and put us through and grandma helped. Most people would probably say something like that. But very few, even smaller yet, is that group of those mothers who know the Lord and love the Lord and are faithful, and are biblical, and are godly, as Proverbs 31 woman here is. A woman that fears God. A virtuous woman. A woman who knows God and loves God and influences her entire home. Now that one is rare beyond measure, priceless beyond even rubies. And what should be the result? If her children are living, if the husband, they should rise up and praise her. And that shouldn't just be kept private, is it? They should rise up and call her blessed and praise her out loud and affirm and cherish and love her. No, no perfect mothers, no perfect wives. No, other one has sins and flaws. We're not looking for, a, oh, I can't match up with this person here. 
No, but the character trait should be the goal of every mother, should the Lord allow you to have children in any way. This morning, I'd like just to preach on the simple title, The Delights and Duties of Motherhood. The Delights and Duties of Motherhood. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll jump into it. Father, thank you for this day. Lord, I want to thank you for my mom. I was able to talk to her today on the way to church, Lord. Thank you that my mom helped lead me to Christ when I was five. I thank you, Lord, for her faithfulness in instilling within us the Bible, the Word of God at a young age, disciplining us and guiding us, praying for us. I thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness for those years when I was wayward. I didn't love and honor and respect my parents. Lord, I thank you for mom's faithfulness. I thank you that she's still living and I'm able to see her. I thank you, Lord, for each one today that is a godly mom, a godly grandma. Lord, we know not everyone. Lord is able to be a mother. But, Lord, everyone has a mother. And I pray that if they're living, we can call her blessed and love her. Lord, some have mothers that are not saved. I know it's their deepest heart's desire that their mother, if they're living, would know Christ and be in heaven with them. Lord, I thank you for those that are here today. Now, Lord, as we look in the Word of God at some truths about motherhood, I don't have to be a mother, Lord, to preach the Bible on what it means to be a mother. Your word speaks on that, Lord, so therefore that's the authority. Lord, we pray that each one that's here today or watching from home would be a saved mother, a saved wife, a saved lady. Each one, Lord, would walk with you, not just on Sundays, but seven days a week and have a real, authentic relationship with you, a woman, a wife, a mother that fears the Lord, that loves the word of God, that is known for her walk with you and her prayer life more than anything else. Now, Lord, speak through me, Lord, today, I pray. Lord, may I not say just what I want to say, but only that which pleases you. Take your word and apply it, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to flip back to Genesis. This is actually where we're starting a new series. If you were with us last week, easy to find. First book of the Bible. It's first or couple pages of the Bible. Go to that first book, the book of Genesis. Genesis means beginnings. I think we know that, right? We talk about family genes, G-E-N-E-S. Does that sound like Genesis, Genesis? Some people are like, voila, I never knew that. All right. <laughs> That's what that means. Your genes, a new generation, a generation. Genesis means beginnings. All right. It's the beginnings. It's the generations. It's what God has done. It is a powerful book. It is there for a reason. It sets the foundation of the entire Bible. It gives us the origins of life, where we came from, why we're here, what our purpose is, where we're going to go, what sin is, why there's sin, why is there death, who's the devil, where did he come from, what about nations and cultures and people and places and homes and families. It's in the book of Genesis. God revealing the truth. And so we started last week looking at some of those truths in chapters 1 and 2. We're going to continue today. I just have two points this morning if you're taking notes. Number one, the designer of motherhood. Obviously, that's God. And number two, the duties of motherhood. The designer of motherhood and the duties of motherhood. Let's look at number one, the designer. Who designed motherhood? Mother God. No. Father God. God himself is the designer of mothers, motherhood, the home, the family. All of that is our great God is the designer of that. Let's look at it. Genesis 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Verse 28, the beginning. And God blessed them, male, female, first home, first family, first marriage. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish, fill the earth and subdue it. So we see even here at the beginning, God created all that is. God created man. God created woman. God created marriage. God created the home. God created physical intimacy in marriage. It's good. It's valuable. It's honorable. It's all of God. And then 6,000 years since then, since sin has entered the world, it's been torn down and being tried to be torn down ever since. If the foundations be destroyed, what does the righteous, what can the righteous do, the Bible says? And Satan 
and the forces of evil in the world and the flesh have turned their cannons on the family and the home and marriage from the very beginning. And they have not ceased to this day, yet God is the designer of mother. It's been said before, and we'll say it again, no greater pro-woman book than the Bible has ever been written. In fact, name, name a country or culture or religious form where the woman is elevated as much as in biblical Christianity. You will not find it. You will not find it in Islam. You will not find it in Buddhism. You will not find it in Confucianism. You will not find it in Hinduism. You will not find it in anything else, in any other way than the Word of God is what has elevated the woman to where she is today. Although many people don't know what the Bible says about it, and they get their doctrine from other sources. But God made the man, and God made the woman, and God made the family, and God made the home, and God made husbands, and God made wives, God made fathers, and God made mothers. And so I'm going to read his book on it. <laughs> not Dr. Spock for the old timers, all right. Not Dr. Zeus. Not Dr. Whoever. Not getting my doctrine on child rearing from Red Book or Good Housekeeping or Reader's Digest or social media sites or the doctor's office. We get it from the designer, God himself. And so God is the designer of marriages and homes and motherhood. It's God's design. Never forget that. Over in chapter number 2 in Genesis, let's continue reading. Genesis 2, 18. And by the way, this church, and as long as I'm the pastor, we're going to stand without apology on the Word of God, and we're going to stand on the Bible and marriage and the home and the roles of the husband and wife, and if we lose people, we lose people. That's too bad, all right? I hope we don't, but we are not going to cower to what the world says we're to do, all right? What do they know about anything? <laughs> not much of anything, all right? God knows we're going to trust him, we're going to see what the word says, and we're going to preach it until he comes again. Genesis 2, what does the Bible say? Verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not, remember, chapter 1 was a general synopsis of creation. Chapter 2, God's going to come back and give a little more detail. So when we get to chapter 2, verse 18, he's going to give us more detail on how he created man. And up to this point, Eve, the woman, has not been created yet. Day 6, verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good, the only thing that was not good, that the man should be alone. I will make him, I will create for him, and help me. Literally, a helper, a compliment, an aid. Not a servant. And help me for him. Verses 19 and 20, God brings the animals to Adam. Adam names them. Verse 20, God gave names to all the cattle and the fowl. But for Adam, there was not found an help me for him. God, it's interesting, God brought those animals to him, not just so he could show his intelligence, but that Adam would see the void that he's missing. Every animal, everything God created has male, female. Male, female has a companion. I'm the only one that doesn't. Now, let's look at what the Bible did. Now, look, we're, gonna, we're not going to try to be humorous here. We're going to be biblical. God, there's only one God, who created everything and is all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful. What did God bring to Adam? Did God bring another man? No. Did God say, I'm going to make another man? That's what he needs. No. Did God bring multiple women? Lots of women? No. One woman that God created and brought to Adam to be the help me. That's God's plan. It's what it says here, verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and clothed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. One man, and he brings one woman to him as a help me. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. No cavemen here, by the way. No, oh, woman. Me, man, you woman. We won't get a doctor from Geico commercials. <laughs> That's what evolution teaches you. Oh, primitive, you woman, you me, oh, we eat. All right. These are the most highly advanced people in the history of the world. They were brilliant, 100% in all of creation. They had no sin. <laughs> Woman, out of man, God brought to me one flesh. Verse 25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Wow. 
God created motherhood. Did you see all the doctrine right here? And by the way, some of the most attacked chapters in the entire Bible are chapters 1 to 11. The most attacked probably portion of all of the Bible are the first 11 chapters of Genesis. That has always been the battlefield. God, creation, marriage, gender, home, family, you name it, right there. It's all right there. Sin, redemption, Satan. Wow, I mean, it's right there. That's the, the flood. What is God doing? I mean, those chapters, you can't believe that stuff. You mean God just spoke, really took a rib. Come on. Well, there's a serpent, and, the, and, the, and the, they so, pfft, are you kidding me? A flood and a boat? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's all God's word, or none of it's God's word. God was there. God told us it's all true. It shows exactly what he's setting forth. God made male and female. Two sexes, two genders. End of story. Marriage, man and a woman. Two distinct roles. Two distinct roles. End of story. A man's not a woman. A woman's not a man. <laughs> They're different. They're different in every way. Phys physiology, you name it, words I can't say, all right? Physically, emotionally, mentally. They're different in every way. Quit, the world tries to say, no, anything a man can do, a woman can do, anything a man can do. Nope, nope. They're completely different. They're completely opposite. They have a difference in role, and God made them that way. The home and the family, God instituted what was his first command to them. Be fruitful and multiply. God created sexual intimacy in marriage, in marriage only, in bounds. It's for pleasure, procreation. Absolutely. Marriage is honorable in all things, valuable, honorable, good, and the bed undefiled. Remember? That's it. Absolutely. Jesus Christ reaffirmed the entire story in the book of Matthew 4,000 years later and said, go back to Genesis. We won't turn to that. When they were asking about marriage, Jesus Christ himself said, yes, I believe the entire account. All right? Have you not known what the beginning says? God created man, male, female, it's all there. Absolutely, that's what God says. So we have exactly what God created. Proverbs 18, 22. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. That's God saying, hey, does that mean everybody's going to be married? No. Does that mean everybody's going to be a, a husband or father? No. Does that mean everybody's going to be a wife or mother? No. Does that mean everybody's going to have children? No. But the Bible does say, whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. We're not going to not read verses of the Bible just because not everybody's married or not everybody this. We're going to see what God says. Absolutely. God is sovereign. God makes no mistakes. I'm not God. I can't answer all the questions. But I know that God is good and what God does is good and right. Genesis 3, though, let's continue, let's continue looking at motherhood because as of Genesis 2, there are no children yet. Genesis chapter 3, we have sin enters in. We'll be looking at that probably next week. But I want to drop down here to a little bit. Adam and Eve sinned. Eve was beguiled by the serpent's subtlety. She took and ate, never says an apple. She ate of whatever fruit it was. She gave to her husband, we'll get to this next week, who it says was with her. There's a well-known message. I think there's even a book called The Silence of Adam. The silence of Adam, who was with her. He took, he ate, he knew exactly what he was doing, and sin plunged into the world. And as Romans 5 says, and as by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, so that all have sinned. All right? It took the second Adam, the last Adam, to come reverse that, the Lord Jesus Christ. But as the Lord is now, as God is giving out judgment, so what happened in the garden, he starts first with the serpent. All right, we won't even really read this. Verse 14, literally, literally, he starts with the actual reptile, the serpent. All right, and curses it. Verse 15, he speaks directly to Satan, who had entered into the serpent, which I want to read. And I will put enmity between thee, Satan, and the Satan seed, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it, that which comes from the woman, we're talking about motherhood here, basically that which is born of a woman one day, shall bruise thy head, Satan, and thou, Satan, shalt bruise his heel. That's often called the first Bible prophecy, the first prophecy of the Redeemer, Christ the Messiah, in the garden. 
He curses the serpent. You're going to crawl the rest of your life on the belly. Satan. There will be ongoing, continual animosity and enemy and friction between you, the wicked one, and the godly seed, my people. And ultimately, it's going to come down to that lifelong battle we're looking at between your seed and between my seed, the good seed, the godly seed. And he gives that promise that from a woman, we know this from the scriptures, from a woman, this is motherhood, from a woman will be born someone, a flesh, a child, a man, who will come and reverse all that's going to happen. The deliverer, the redeemer, the savior will come from what? A woman, a mother. Wow, think of that. Eve, the first woman, just sinned. Adam, the first man, just sinned. And God could have said, I'm done with you. And he says, no, from a woman, the very one who took and ate first, from her womb will be born one day the Redeemer, the Deliverer, the Savior, who will come and conquer the serpent, Satan, and sin, and death, and reverse all of this and offer eternal salvation to the woman. Wow, motherhood. Isn't that a blessing? But notice the... What comes with that, ladies, verse 16, under the woman, he said, now he goes to Eve, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. Apparently there would have been some pain and sorrow, but multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Children. You're going to have children. Now, how did Adam and Eve know any of this? He, they're hearing God say this. You're going to have children. That there's going to be judgment through that childbearing. And we'll get to this when it comes to the roles. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Then he moves to Adam, the man, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat it cursed as the ground. You're going to continue. And ultimately, the final judgment is you're going to go back to dust. You're going to die. You're going to die. All right? Whoa. So we're going to look at that in upcoming weeks here. All of that, but did you, did you, don't miss the great promise that from a woman, a wife and a mother would be the plan of redemption that she would carry in her womb. That's, who can even imagine that? Of course, we see all of Scripture that God himself would be born as a baby, carried in a woman's womb, yet without sin because of virgin birth. That would be the Redeemer. Is that not God's blessing on motherhood? Is that not God's great honor of a mother? Mary, of course, the lady, but motherhood in general. What a great blessing. Is there a higher calling, a role, than to be a wife and a mother based on what God says in the Scriptures? I think not. The designer of motherhood is God. God. What a blessing. Number two, let's take a look real quick here at the duties of motherhood. You say, oh, boy, this will take a long time. The duties of motherhood, right? You can read lots of little things. I'm sure there's many things floating out there in cyberspace and, and social media today on mothers and thanking the little quotes and memes and sayings and all of those kind of things. I don't think there's an end to all the roles of a mother, those that are currently mothers, grandmothers, those that maybe one day will be, or you think back to your own mother. Here's one small list, right? Nurse, teacher, cook, housekeeper, planner, organizer, taxi driver, decorator, storyteller, caregiver, activity director, disciplinarian, prayer warrior, cheerleader, and chief boo-boo kisser, all right? I'm sure you can add much more to that list. But even that probably doesn't cover all. Woo all right, and I'm sure, knowing my mother and my wife and many of you ladies, you're like, I can't do it. <laughs> What is this? No one told me. I need sleep. This is impossible. One child, two children. However many there are. Some of you come from large families. Some of you in, in this congregation, you had 10 siblings or 12 siblings. Or, you're like, what? You know, it blows the world out, doesn't it? I mean, it does. My, my oldest sister has eight. All right? Some of you, and, and they're like, what? You know, they can't even stand. Because the world's philosophy is completely the opposite of the Bible. The Bible says children are a blessing of the Lord and blessed is the fruit of the womb. You know what that means? Children are of God and the more you have, the merrier it should be. But that is not what the world teaches. One is enough and they're trouble. And you know what? If that's all, praise God. But if one's trouble, what's two, three, four, eight? Ah! That's what they say. That's it. You don't want any. They're going to ruin your life. You're not going to have any time for yourself. 
What about your me time? Don't you hear a lot of moms say that? Oh, boy, that's, that's sad. What about my me time? I mean, I guess that's okay. Sure, you do need your time, but does God make a mistake? What's a mother? What's a wife? What's a husband? Whoa, it takes, wow. God designed it. So the duties, I'm not here to give an exhaustive list of duties. I can't speak because I'm not a wife or a mother. But the Bible speaks on that. What are the chief duties of a mother based on the Bible? The Bible now. The Bible. Not what you think it is. Not what your social group says it should be. Not what all the self-help parenting books and magazines. I remember we got all those too. Most of them you got to throw in the garbage can. All right? They're, not, they're, they're pretty much all anti-God. All right, anti what the Bible says. And I know what all the books and the things you can get in self-help and what forum groups and mother groups and chat groups today probably go to. But what says the Bible? Or do you believe the Bible is not relevant anymore? Or do you believe that God has no idea what it's like to be a mother in 2023? And that God's old and he didn't realize what would be around today and and the, and the different technicality things in advanced society and the things your kids are exposed to, whether an infant or a little one or a teenager or even older. Or does God know all things and God gave us a book, a manual, for how to have a home and a family? And I mean, he did, didn't he? What are the chief duties of a mother, if you're a mother here today? Well, you've got to always keep these in line. It's no different really than a father or a believer or a person. But these are always, our entire life, we all struggle with keeping these in the proper order. My relationship with my God. My Father is my number one relationship, and I am to love Him with all my heart and soul and mind and body. That is numero uno. Before my husband, before myself, and before my children. That's a hard one for all of us. I know, but there's, there's lots to do. But if that's not first, it'll all unravel. Real quick, the number one chief duty of a mother is a relationship with God. We trust that you're a saved mother. Not going to do any good to pray daily without being in God's family. You need to be saved. You need to be born again. You need to be in God's family. You need to make sure that he is truly your God, that you have been saved through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, and your sins are washed away. And even though most of us would say, if anybody's going to go to heaven, it was my mother. She was a saint. She was an angel. She was the sweetest thing. She's also a sinner. <laughs> and she needs saved mothers and wives. and We all need to be born again. But a chief duty of a mother is a relationship with God. Number two is a relationship with her husband. That is before the children. We'll get to fathers on Father's Day. But... The children are not above God, and they're not above the husband, both in time and attention. I understand when they're infant and things like that, and absolutely, but your relationship with your husband should not be squandered. Number three is a relationship with the children. Always remember, the children are a gift from God. They're temporary. They're, you're training them to leave the home, aren't you? You're training them and trying to instill biblical character in them from a very young age, knowing that they're going to one day, Lord willing, start their own family and have their own family unit. And that they will know, yes, they'll always be your children, and, and it'll, it'll go from a child-parent relationship to more of a friend-friend, won't it? Is really what it becomes as they get older. And they will, you know, but they will no longer be under you. They'll always be your children, but it'll be a new family unit, but your husband is always your husband. That's an eternal covenant till death does you part. And that can't be squandered. And there's a reason you see a lot of people get divorced after 25, 30 years of marriage. When the kids are all out of the home. And the husband and wife have no connection anymore. Because for 18, 20 years, all they did was live for their kids. And they're now strangers. They really are. They're strangers. We, reported every, we, we took them to dance and parks and sports and, blah, 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 and they ran them everywhere and there was no true marriage relationship and they lived for their children for their entire life and then when the kids are gone, who are you? Seriously, I'm sad. You see it all the time. That's because you didn't keep your priorities in line. God, then the spouse, then the children. Children are a wonderful gift from God, but they are not to be idols. 
They are not to be toys. They are not just their gifts from God. You don't know how long you'll have them. They are from God to raise for His honor and His glory and to prepare them one day to leave and to serve God, I hope, with all of their hearts, even if it's at a distance. Say, praise God. All right, they're living for the Lord. That is the chief duty, really, of the mother. I'm going to turn to the New Testament here. I'd love for you to turn to this. There are two, two verses back to back. 1 Timothy 5.14. Now, these verses are not going to be popular in today's world. Now, I know, I mean, it doesn't bother me. I don't really care about it. But, <laughs> but I know some people care, all right, about what does the world think. But uh, these verses will be, and again, I, I, we'll get to this when we look at the roles of a man and a woman and a husband and a wife. Not so much today, but... Um, Entire society tries to make men women and women men. Tries to make women masculine and men feminine. <laughs> and they say we're exactly equal and we should be able to do everything. Well, that's the old, what's the old Nike commercial, right? Come on now, anything you can do, I can do better. Can remember Mia Hamm back in the day, Michael Jordan. All right, cute little jitty and all that stuff. And, woo and many people don't understand the, the difference between men and women and, and they think you're lowering a man or you're lowering a woman if you don't think we're exactly equal. We, we need to understand those roles and we'll look at those in future messages. But what about the mother? What does the Bible say is the chief duty and role of a mom? That would be great to, to have the, woman, the women polled before you came into the service. Three by five card, no looking anywhere. What is your chief duty as a mother? And see if it would be a biblical answer or not. Chief duty. All right. Well, let's just look at two verses in the New Testament and see what the Bible says. 1 Timothy 5, verse 14. 1 Timothy 5, 14. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak. You know what guide the house means? It's the, it's the age-old answer that a lot of ladies used to give when they'd say, what's your occupation? And you'd be housewife, homemaker. That used to be a sign of pride. Now it's a thing, well, well, I don't work. I guess you do, right? You're like, uh, oh, well, I'm a homemaker. I'm a housewife. I'm, you know, that, that used to be what everybody was for the most part. And we're not here today. We're not talking about it. It's not a sin, I don't believe, to, to work outside of the home and necessarily like that. We have to give some Christian liberty and some things like that. We understand not all homes are the same. But what does the Bible say? Hey, young women marry, bear children, guide the house. That idea there of guide the house is literally to be the overseer. Right? The, the husband is the head of the home. The wife is the heart of the home. There, there's a reason they have signs that say, if mama ain't happy, what? Ain't nobody happy. All right? That doesn't mean that she rules the house, but we, we understand what that means. All right? All right? Uh, in a biblical home, yeah, dad should be the one. He's the final authority. But, whoa, you better watch it. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. All right? Good. You're going to be cooking your own food. Or, you know. So we understand that there's a, there's a role there, and that's the overseer role. That doesn't mean that she's the boss, she's the number one decision maker, although that is in some homes. The idea here is to guide the house. Just look a page or two over to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. We must hurry and wrap this up. Titus 2, it's giving Bible counsel to the older men and the older women. In fact, I looked at this a lot last year. But notice one of the things that older ladies, especially older mothers, are to do. Titus 2 verse 3. The aged women, that's this, the older women, probably ladies, your, your children are no longer in the home. Likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. So you have to yourself be a high character lady that knows the Lord. But look at verse 4. That they may teach the young women, the young wives, the young mothers, to be sober. That has to do with your thinking. Notice that's first. You've got to have proper thinking or forget it. That's sober, biblical, sound thinking. To love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Every, every modern feminist would have cut that out of their Bible by now. I made a mockery of that based on years of secularism and humanism. <gasps> they would look at that as the lowest form of a thing a woman can do, whereas God says that's the highest. That's the highest thing. Well, so, oh, you, no, keep it home. Absolutely. Chief duty. You say, does that mean you have to be? No. But the idea here is both of those terms mean guide of the home, homemaker, guardian, ruler, overseer. The best example is Old Testament Joseph. Old Testament Joseph was sold as a slave, bought by Potiphar, and eventually what did Potiphar make him? Overseer of the entire home. 
Now, who was in charge? Potiphar. But who was next in charge? Joseph. Joseph guided and ran everything, but he answered to Potiphar. Later on, the same thing. He became governor and overseer of all of Egypt, answerable only to Pharaoh. That's really what those terms mean. Keeper at home, guide of the home. The home is what God designed you primarily for. That is your castle. All right? Doesn't mean you can't be outside of the home. Doesn't mean you never leave that. Doesn't mean you're some low person. Doesn't mean you're a slave or a servant. But that's how God designed you primarily. And he said, you're the overseer. You're, yes, I like what one, one said here. The definition here is this. Uh, you're the guardian of the home, moms, wives. You're the guardian of the home under your husband's authority and leadership. That's the biblical role right there. The husband is the head of the home. He is to be the spiritual leader. He is the one that says primarily is to, the image of God will be passed down to the children through the dad. And under his authority and leadership, but under that, a wife is the one that sort of guides and oversees and rules. And that's what the Bible says right here. Absolutely. You say, well, you didn't get to the true purpose. What's the true purpose here? Just to make my husband happy? All right. Just make all the kids happy? Well, what about me? All right. What about me? You'll find that when you're doing exactly what God says, you'll be the most satisfied, most fulfilled. It's interesting. We get Reader's Digest still. I rarely read it anymore. But for years, all those magazines have taken polls of secular people. And even in the secular world of the women that work, uh, it's always a high percent, 75% or more say, if at all possible, if I didn't have to, I wouldn't. I'd love to be home with the kids. That's not even Christian people. Absolutely. If I didn't have to, I would love to just be at home with the family and the home and the children, if at all possible. Even the lost, unsaved world will say that. doesn't mean that you have to do that in your home. But I certainly would say it's probably the number one ideal thing, if at all possible, uh, to do that. Mom's there with the children, especially when they're young, at those young ages, zero to five are the key ages for the children, all right? You say, Pastor Boy, you didn't get to the number one responsibility. I'm going to read a verse in Malachi 2, and we're going to wrap it up here. Malachi chapter 2, it's a book very few people read. But if I said, can you give me a Bible answer for the very purpose of a home and family? Now, I, I didn't say you could, you could give a good answer uh, to glorify God. And that would be right for a lot of stuff, right? Teenagers can glorify God. Moms glorify God. Husbands glorify God. Christian glorify God. Church glorify God. I got that. But can you give me Bible truth that reveals what is God's purpose for the home unit? Why did God create the home and the family in the very first place? Yes, in the New Testament, we read that uh, it was an Old Testament mystery, the marriage between a husband and wife, the picture of Christ and the church. That's, an old te- that's a mystery that was not revealed till New Testament. So I can see, but I'm asking about the home, the family. That would be husband and wife. What is God's true design for the home and the family? Because if you don't know, what if we're all failing? I mean that with all my heart. If you don't know the answer, then how do we know that we're not all failing at what God designed? I don't want to fail. I want to do it God's way. Why does, why did he institute marriage? Why did he create male, female? Why is there homes and families? Why did God institute that at the very beginning, 4,000 years before the local church? before government and anything. What is the importance of the unit of the home and the family in the very first place? We have a little answer right here in Malachi 2, a little Old Testament prophecy book, often not read much or just skimmed through. You see a quick truth in Malachi 2, verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Have not one God created us, showing that God created everything and everyone that lives? But look at verse 15, Malachi 2, 15. Maybe circle this if you've never read this verse. And did not he make one? By the way, if you go back and read this chapter, he's dealing primarily here with divorce and and the intent of what marriage is, but we're just reading one verse. And did he not make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? So why two become one, husband and wife? That he might seek a godly seed. I believe right there is the number one purpose of the home family. God has instituted that, that a saved mom and a saved dad, husband, wife, God, if God blesses them with children, one or more, that they are to raise those children for the honor and glory of God to produce godly seed for God's kingdom and God's glory. Because, folks, we're all going to die. Mom and dad, you're not always going to be here. 
You want to raise godly seed to carry on the work of God and the truths of the scripture to the next generation. Can I say this? That's all that matters. That is all that matters. It really is. That made it, the world would say that's ridiculous, but that's not ridiculous. All that matters is that you produce godly seed and you say, my chief end is to raise these children for the glory of God so that if all possible, they know God personally and deeply and love him and serve him. And so every ounce of everything I do is important for the glory of God and I've got to guard their hearts with everything I have. You show me something else where it's another purpose for it. We're not here to entertain our kids. We're to train them. I like what some preacher said. I'll finish with this. It's so true. Our goal is not to get your children into Harvard, but to get them into heaven. <laughs> but their parents said that's our whole purpose. They're trying to get them into these schools. How about getting them into heaven? How about making sure they're in heaven one day for all of eternity? Our most important thing is not our kid's resume. I hear resume. I was a youth pastor. I got so sick of resume. Well, I don't think about my kid's resume. Or what they're going to do one day. I'm just going to raise them for honor. And they're going to do what God does, I hope, because they know that. It's not their resume. It's their relationship with God that matters. God will take care of all the rest of that. We're to build like Christ-like character, not their grade point average. Grade point. Wow, that's the number one. That's not the number one thing. That is not the main purpose of your children, living vicariously through them in sports and grades and college. Fine if they want to do those things. It doesn't mean those things are wrong. But the number one chief duty of a mother, of a father, of a home, is to raise godly seed for the glory of God. Yes, your children have a free will just as you do. No they probably all will not turn out godly. No, they may not all know the Lord. But you're going to do everything you can in your power as long as they are in your home and God has given you influence over them as long as you have them to make sure that they are godly seed for the honor and glory of God in everything you do. It's a great challenge today. I I feel, I don't feel bad. I feel bad for moms and dads, modern people today with social media. Just think of how different we'd all be if that was out. I think of all the moms and people who just, they compare constantly to what other moms are putting on social media. Um, you'll be a much more effective mom if you just put, closed off that for a month, I promise you. you. You'll never live up to the pressures of all these things other moms are doing. All right? Crafts and buildings and going here and going there. and fam blah. You're going to try to be like other moms instead of just being what God wants you to be. You don't have to match all the other people. Half the stuff they put on there, they're not as happy and cheerful as they look. You don't have to do all the things and all those kind of things. You just need to be the mom that God made you to be. And, and you, you don't have to be a super mom. You, God gave you everything you need to be a godly mother. And you don't have to match up with any other mom and any other personality and other, other family and even your own mother or grandmother. You are to be the mom God made you to be with God's word as your guide. And if you have one child or 20 children, whatever it may be, you say, for God is my, my help, I want to raise each one. They know God. Even before they can begin speaking, I want the Bible to be their chief influence. And godly music and God's people and brought them God's house. And they know God and they love God. And if they're going to turn from God, it's their choice. And I didn't give them any opportunity. I didn't introduce anything that tur turned away their heart from God. I want to love them. I love where Timothy, it says, from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures. Timothy, your mother, your grandmother, and if it looks like his dad was not saved, it looked like his dad may not have been in the home, but your godly mom and grandma raised you and from a little boy, and that would have been Old Testament too, by the way, probably the law. <laughs> we don't often read that for devotions, all right? Genesis through Deuteronomy, you were raised, you knew the Scriptures, you received Jesus Christ as Savior. Praise God. For that. Moms, you're going to be tempted to say, I can't do it. You're going to be tempted to say, I'm not appreciated. You're going to be tempted to say, well, look at all the other moms. You're going to be tempted to say, I fail too much. You're going to be tempted to say, well, what about me? I don't have any time for myself. I don't think I can do it. But one day at a time, with the Lord's help, you can. Oh, I was going to preach on Eve, but I'm not going to do that. But you ever think about that, ladies, Eve? No mom there when the baby was born, no mother in law. 
No, who do you look to? Nobody ever had a baby. There were no parents. They didn't have any parents. No hospitals, no modern conveniences. I don't even, did they even know what was happening? What do we do? <laughs> no Bible, no Holy Spirit, no church, no pastor, no counseling books, no self-help books. What do we do? <laughs> you gave us a baby. I don't know. All right? We have no one to look to. It's just, wow. All right? Wow. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And yet, God was there for her. God was there for Adam. And they were able. We have the entire Bible. We have a church. We have the Holy Spirit. We have everything we need as moms and dads and husbands and wives and even individuals that aren't married to live for God and to know God. And we're to do all that we can do to raise godly seed for the honor and glory of God. It's not too late. You haven't failed. You can't change the past. But you can, from this moment on, say, God, I just... That's exactly what God's waiting for some moms to say. I can't do it. I can't do it, God. I fail every time. And God says, now you're ready. You've got to do it through me. You've got to keep me first. You've got to be on your knees. You've got to be empowered by the Spirit. And then one day at a time, with my help, you can do it. God doesn't give us what we can't handle. Aren't you grateful for virtuous women? Aren't you good? godly mothers and godly fathers? Many daughters have done excellently, but thou excels them all. And if you're here today and you've got a mom still living and she's been a godly, faithful mom, I hope you let her know that. Love on her, encourage her. I think there's a lot of moms that wonder, if they were honest, I don't know if I was a good mom or not. <laughs> I think I was. I hope I was, but I don't really know. I don't really know what my kids really think. Oh, they take me out, I get the card, but I just don't really know. And sometimes they need to know it. They need to hear it. More than the generic, thank you for all you did. You're a great mom. Love you. I guarantee you mom's doubt. Dad's doubt. Mom's wonder. They're just not confident if they made much of a difference. And if your mom or your dad are still living and they made a difference, you need to tell them that. And if you're a private person and a quiet person and you just don't do that kind of stuff, get over that. You can get over that because you need to tell them. You need to be uncomfortable. You need to write to them. You need to let them know that. And you tell them specifically what made the difference. I'm grateful that my mom is still living at 78. She comes up here often. Uh, I didn't respect and honor and love my mom for many years. I was rebellious, didn't care for her, didn't like her. You know, didn't tell her to her face. Hypocrite, do my own thing, didn't value my parents. I'm thankful my mom, my mom prayed a lot for me. My mom wrote me lots of letters when I was in college, and most people don't know what that is anymore, I know, all right, FaceTime, but uh, I, mean, I, I can, every once in a while I'll find an old letter, and like, I oh, didn't even probably appreciate this, I don't know if I read it. Mom write me letters like every week, every two weeks, care packages, I mean, just, yeah, wow, prayed for me, tears for me, loved me, I'm so thankful when I was five, my mom led me to Christ at devotions. My dad traveled a lot when I was young, gone a lot, a lot of weekends, he traveled to conventions and different things, and my mom was very faithful family devotions, my sister and I, then my younger sister, family devotions, Maxie and Minnie, some of you might remember the old Maxie and Minnie, uh, Keys for Kids, different things, Flannel Graph, Betty Lukens, you name it, all right, uh, praying, praying as a family, praying for missionaries, things we didn't like as kids, taking us to visit people, during the nursing home, uh, things we didn't really like, all right, going to church all the time, uh, you know, all those kind of things, we didn't like them, all right, but because the Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. It's in our DNA. We're wicked. We're sinners. We don't like that kind of stuff. And it takes a godly mom and dad. It takes a godly single parent that loves the Lord to say, we're going to get that out of that, all right, with God's help. And God's word is sufficient. And you are able. And all moms and dads, you can do it with God's help. Let's rejoice in the role of motherhood. Let's rejoice in the God who designed it. And let's attack what we have, if we would, with God's help, and doing it in a great manner for God's honor and God's glory. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to close in prayer. No invitation today. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm just going to pray. No formal invitation. But if you're here today, maybe you're not even married. Maybe one day you will be. Maybe you just need to decide. You're a young lady. God, I want to be a godly wife and mother one day if you allow me. Maybe you say, well, I don't, God's not blessed us with children. I want to be a godly wife. I want to influence people for the honor and glory of God. All of us have mothers. They may not be living. We can thank them, we can praise them, we can encourage them, we can pray for them. They're flawed just like we are. But if you're here today and you are a mother, maybe your children are in heaven, maybe your children have passed away, maybe they're stillborn. 
Maybe your children are not walking with the Lord right now. Maybe you're not sure if they're saved. Maybe they're out of the home and you're more of a grandparent realm right now and they have to come to you for advice. But why don't you right now just say, God, I'm still giving my role of motherhood to you, whether they're in the house or not, whether you bless us with more children or none. God, I want to do everything I can to honor and glorify them. God's working in your heart about changing some things. Talk to your husband. Talk to someone. Get some help. It's okay. Walk by faith. You can do it. God can help you. It's okay to get some help and some counsel and some prayer. You're not a failure. I thank the Lord that God designed motherhood and that the Messiah came from a mother, a womb. We're thankful for the opportunity we have to honor our wives and mothers today, and I pray today would be a wonderful day. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the mothers that are living, perhaps, that we can encourage and wrap our arms around them and say, Mama, I love you. Could be a mother that's not saved that we desperately, like Brother Mike Parent, Lord, with his mother that just received you as Savior. What a blessing. Lord, may we never stop praying. May we never stop honoring. May we never stop respecting. And may we never stop praising, Lord, those that have influenced us in a great way. Lord, may we be determined to know the Bible, to believe the Bible, and to live the Bible. Lord, you designed the home. You designed marriage. You designed children. You've given us a manual. It always works when we do it your way, Lord. Help us by faith to raise our children for the honor and the glory of God. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. I know many of you may be getting with moms, grandmas. Have a great family afternoon. No choir. We'll see you at 6 o'clock. Some of you tonight. Lord bless you.